Good morning. Welcome on this Labor Day weekend where we continue our series on the Beatitudes as we look at the second of what are eight Beatitudes. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. One announcement to share with you before we begin with our opening hymn, O Day of Rest and Gladness. If you would like to help out with Hurricane Laura Relief, many of you have asked, and we can help out a congregation in our southern district. The Lutheran Church Missouri Synod is comprised of 45 different districts. Our district, the southern district, is Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and more or less the panhandle of Florida. So where Hurricane Laura hit in Louisiana, that in, in a sense is in our own backyard as far as our church body is concerned. And on the back cover of your bulletin, you will see that there is a little opportunity for us to support St. John Lutheran Church in Lake Charles, Louisiana. There is a little station in the hallway. There's a table with the offering box and these envelopes. And if you would like to support them in their rebuild, there's a picture of the sanctuary that gives you a little bit of a sample. They were hit pretty hard and the sanctuary more or less was uh, destroyed and naturally all the contents inside of the sanctuary as well. So they face a, a pretty significant rebuilding project and if you would like to help support them, uh, that is greatly appreciated. Again, we look at blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted as we stand to sing our opening hymn, O Day of Rest and Gladness, we rise to sing. We make our beginning this day in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, Your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me. 
he, a poor sinful being. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given his only Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all of our sins. To those who believe on his name, he gives the power to become the children of God and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. Amen. We join together Psalm 34 responsively. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears toward their cry. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Lord of all consolation, your servant, the psalmist, reminds us, you turned our wailing into dancing, you removed our sackcloth and clothed us with joy. We grieve the conviction of our lost condition before you. Send now your spirit, the comforter, to move us from our sorrow over sin to celebrating our Savior, blessing us with the confidence of the cross, so that we might not grieve like the world, but with a hope, and a hope that will never disappoint us. We pray this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Congregation may be seated for our readings. This morning's Old Testament reading comes from the book of Isaiah, 53rd chapter. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle lesson comes from the 21st chapter of Revelation. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. This is the word of the Lord. 
please rise for the response hymn. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you a comforter to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And we confess our common old Christian faith. We use the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died in And we remain standing to sing.
Can we bow our heads in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, you promised that you will exchange our tears of sadness into ones of gladness as we pray this day that you would bless those who mourn, who grieve over their sin, and you promised that through the cross and open tomb that we will be comforted. In your name, O oh Lord, we ask this in all things as we continue looking at these marks and characteristics of the Christian life through your gift of the Sermon on the Mount and these Beatitudes. In your name we pray. Amen. Congregation may be seated. Well, college football is back, and it is good to see UAB kicked off on Thursday night. Alabama-Auburn right around the corner for us here in the South, where we should whisper it here in church and not say it too loud, where we will gladly confess, well, it, where it is a religion, right, where SEC football is just that to us. Uh, it's good to see that it is back. We all love college football here in the South, and I'm, I'm right there with you. And the beginning of the season, there's always this excitement, hope springs eternal. But my favorite part of the college football season is actually at the end of the regular season. Not yet to the bowl time, but the end of the regular season. And I just kind of enjoy talk radio. I enjoy the SEC network. I like going home in the afternoon, uh, maybe for lunch, and you... You lay back in the Lazy Boy and you, you get your bag of chips and, you know, as the old saying goes, your, your favorite adult beverage. And I like just listening to the Paul Feinbaum show. Actually, I just, I just like listening to them argue and debate and discuss. And I think this year I'm going to enjoy it even more because I don't know about you, but I'm tired of all the arguing about coronavirus. I'm, I'm going to be tired about all the, the debating about red state, blue state, a presidential election season. So it'll be kind of nice for once just to have some good old-fashioned arguments with friends and family about, to be honest, something that really, truly, even though we say it's a religion, we know it's not, truly something that really just doesn't matter that much. Well, what do they always argue about, all right? And they, they cannibalize each other. I mean, just turn on the radio. Um, it's kind of fun. It's like watching a train wreck, right? It's, it's one of those things where they argue about the college football playoff at the end of the regular season because four teams get in and you don't automatically qualify, do you? You have to be selected by this committee, this nebulous college football playoff committee that's out there. And you know that every year the, 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 the one and two teams, they're pretty much a shoe in Everybody agrees. Third team in, uh, maybe, maybe a little bit of controversy, but usually not much. Everybody says, yeah, they deserve to get in. But number four, the first in, and the argument about the first out, all right? So about four, five, and six, those are the ones where everybody really tries to stake a claim and say, yeah, we're the ones that belong in. So remember all these discussions, right? So remember that time Alabama got in, selected as the number four team, but they didn't win the SEC championship. They didn't even play for an SEC championship. They didn't even win the SEC West. In fact, they finished second on their side of the bracket. And so the Pac-12 champions like, hey, we won our conference. You didn't even play for a conference championship or, or the Big Ten winner. And they're like, we should go in ahead of you. And so everybody just, they just go at it. Or how about when there's two teams from the SEC that take up the four spots? And then everybody else in the, around the country, right, they call in and they're all mad. This is supposed to be a national championship, right? Not some sort of regional intersectional ch championship. And hey, hey, let the other guys have a crack at it. It just can't all be about you guys down in the southeast. Or what about the team that is kind of the mid-major or the non power five so there's five big conferences in, in, in college football but there's all these other guys that are playing and so central florida or a boise state you know they go undefeated they kind of just run through the table they just run over everybody on their schedule and they're like well i mean shouldn't they have the chance to play against the big boys right and have a chance to kind of say hey we belong there give us a shot right and so then they argue and then there's always notre dame right the independent nobody likes notre dame right you know notre dame's always like well you know let us try to have a, a shot at it right and so you get all of these arguments and all these fights about who deserves to be in the college football playoff 
So what do they do? All right, so I see them right now. So I see, you know, I can see Reese Davis at the desk, and I can see Desmond Howard and Lee Corso and, and Kirk Herbstreet, and I see them, and so they're, they're trying to decide, okay, let's take away the bias, right? So let's, take a, let's make this fair, all right? You know, because some people, they just want to see the big names, the big coaches, the big programs in. And in others, you know, they don't. They're like, you know, we're tired of seeing the same teams over and over again. You know, let's see some new blood in college football. So what do they do? They go to the board. And what they do is they, they, they look at their resumes. You're used to seeing that. They throw them out there. And now what they do is they, they do a blind resume, right? So they take away the name of the school and the program. So you're not biased by that. So you're not influenced. And so they'll do a blind resume where they cover up the name of the school. You don't know. But then they put their bodies of work and they compare and contrast. So they'll put up the two, three schools that are trying to vie for that last spot. Who deserves to get in? And so they'll put their record up, their strength of schedule, their margin of victory, their power rankings, their top ten wins. If they do have a loss, how bad of a loss was it? What was that team that they lost to? You know, what was the score? You know, and then they go through all of these things and then they look at it and then resume. Blind resume. Who should be selected in and who should not? So by now you're saying, boy, Pastor Almay really must have missed, you know, sports and college football during this pandemic. You say, what does this have to do with anything? Well, Hopefully this kind of helps us understand this second of eight of the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. What is this talking about in the Christian life? Well, first of all, remember that it does take some plowing through and trying to use maybe an example that we're familiar with here in the South to help us understand the unfamiliar. Because what the Beatitudes are hitting at, remember, they're the marks and the characteristics of what the Christian looks like in the kingdom of God. So again, it's saying this is what a Christian will look like. And what Jesus is warning us, to use that term, or reminding us, kind of tapping us on the shoulder and saying, okay, guys, the things that are the marks and the characteristics of the Christian are going to be far different than what anybody will ever, ever think. Because as you read through the, the Beatitudes, you would say, well, how can you be, the last one we'll look at, number eight, how can you be blessed to be persecuted? Nobody's going to buy that. But yet Jesus is going to say this is going to be true. Remember, any time uh, that the world is doing something, Jesus is probably going to be doing something different. It's always a good reminder in your Christian life. If the world's kind of hailing something and kind of putting it up on a pedestal, usually that's something for you to think through. Because remember, the world is not in the same place where Christ is at. So these Beatitudes are going to be different, so we need kind of a way to think through them in a, in a different way, right? And so this idea about blessed are those who, who mourn, for they will be comforted, let's first understand what we're talking about mourn. Now, throughout Scripture, there's two types of mourning. There's the mourning for the loss of a loved one. So we immediately run to the open tomb, we go to Easter, the resurrection, creed, you know, he'll come again. And he will resurrect all flesh, right? Take us to be with him. And our passage in Revelation this day, and in heaven there's no more tears, no more crying, because that separation, that grief that you have being separated from your loved one, in heaven you're reunited, and you'll never be separated from them again. The grief is done, over, gone. Christ is victorious over that for you. So is there a part of this beatitude that is comforting those that have lost a loved one that's going to heaven, reminding them of this grand reunion? Yes. But more so, this specific Matthew 5, 5, this beatitude, the second of eight, blessed are those who mourn, it's a different type of mourning that Jesus is really honing in on this day. He's talking more about the mourning over sin. This profound sense of loss that you recognize in your heart of hearts that what sin has done to this perfect creation, we had everything here. Remember, Eden means paradise. It was perfect. 
And because of our sin, my sin, the reason why there's pandemics in this world, there's unrest on the streets, while there's cancer and heart disease and divorce and discord and family, and while all of these sad things happen, it isn't because of everybody else out there. What this beatitude is saying is that blessed are those who mourn over their sin, that the reason why all that happens, all of the craziness of coronavirus, it's not President Trump's fault. It's not the Chinese. Chinese fault. It's not Dr. Fauci's fault. It's not the health care. It's not those crazy teenagers out there running around not wearing masks. What blessed are the mourn is saying is the reason why this is out there, I confess it's me. The reason why all this craziness is out there, the sin, sickness, and suffering out there, is when I come into church, I recognize this profound sense of loss, and I say, this is all happening in the world because of me, Michael David Allmeyer, born September 28, 1975 in Peoria, Illinois. That I recognize that my sin, it's not just that life is hard or challenging, but I've, I've exchanged a perfect creation. My sin is an affront to God's holiness and His glory and His perfection. We had it so good. It's like the young guy who, who's got the date to the prom with the, with the homecoming queen, right? But then he, he blows it because he does something kind of, well, let's just say foolish. So now he's stuck taking his sister to the prom, right? And he just kind of sits there with his buddies and he's like, man, you know, cry me a river, right? You know, hand me the cry towel here. I just absolutely blew this. That's what Jesus is talking about. Blessed are those who mourn. Well, back to the whole resume thing, right? So what are we talking about here with, with the resume? One of the things that you and I struggle with, even in our Christian life, even though we get hit over and over again, hit in a good way, right? We get hit over and over again, this kind of this pounded into us, ingrained into us, again, in a good way. By faith you're saved, right? By grace you are saved through faith. Not of your own works, right? But we still struggle with this. And the family members and the friends around us, they, they still struggle with this. And the unbelievers who have never heard the gospel are certainly going to struggle with this because they've never even heard the gospel, this good news at all that we're saved by, by grace through faith. And what happens is, is, as we live our lives, we fall back into this resume mode. So remember last week I held up this little... Folder. Remember, uh, the Pharisee and the tax collector, blessed are the poor in spirit. We talked about the one comes thinking his resume looks so good to offer to God. That didn't work. The other one realizes that his resume has nothing to offer to God. A poverty, poor in spirit, and it's solely the righteousness of Christ that is resume. So we're keeping the same theme as the resume because also the Beatitudes, while they're all different, they're all kind of the same. They're like a building block. Jesus is kind of saying you can't get to two until one, can't get to three until two. And they kind of all in the center have the same kind of theme to it while they kind of approach it from a different perspective. So the mourning and the poverty of spirit this day are very, very similar in their focus. And you and I sometimes, we struggle understanding who's in and who's out. All right, you got that? Who's selected in and who's out? Who's going not to the final for the playoff, right? The college football playoff. Who's in heaven and who's not? Who's in the kingdom of God? Who's not? Who's in with Christ and who's not? Because we try to base it on this resume. We fall back to it. And that's what Jesus is hitting in our beatitude this day. And before we kind of talk about that more, let's first give ourselves an example. We're on a low budget production here. So we've just got the good old fashioned whiteboard here to look at. We've got X and Y. We've got two people. And what we usually do is we look at this kind of as a blind resume. Because people will kind of look at it and say, well, so-and-so is a Christian and so-and-so is a non-Christian, but you know, they both do a lot of really foolish things and they both sin. So why does one get to go to heaven and why, why is one out? In fact, sometimes the person who's the unbeliever looks a lot better than the Christian. And so you say, wait a second, is that fair, right? Hey, we belong in the playoff, right? You're just favoring those, those guys from down in the south, right? So you got X and Y. And X here gets, let's say, charitable giving. We'll kind of go by some of the things we normally use. Remember, the Beatitudes are the births, 
marks, the characteristics of the Christian life. So let's compare and contrast that to kind of a lot of the character things that we judge ourselves and others by. A lot of times we just kind of immediately go to like charitable giving. You know, let me see your tax return. What did you give to charitable giving? So X here gives 5%. Y over here way outdoes them, 15, 15% over here. And then besides charitable giving, sometimes we go community church involvement. X over here sings in the choir, but so does Y. Y sings in the choir, and then also does scouts, also belongs to the Kiwanis Club, we'll say, really active with that. So once again, Y's the winner, right? Then we usually kind of judge them by like their marital life, family life, that's another big indicator. So X over here will say divorce times two, two times. And Y over here has been married for 40 years. And if health goes well and all that, I mean, they'll be on their way to the 50, the golden anniversary, and way beyond that. Then sometimes we judge them by their family, you know, their kids. X over here, you know, they did their best raising their, their child, but let's just say they're a little bit of a reform project. They always have been and found themselves in prison. Y over here is two, two children, two children that are, let's just say, they're kind of, you know, we're really well respected in the community. One's a doctor, a surgeon, and the other one's a lawyer. You know, the one's the doctor, the one that does all of your hip and knee replacements. Everybody loves going to them and thanks them, you know. The other one's a lawyer, got their picture on the billboards around town, but for the right reasons, not the wrong reasons. And then X over here, again, Y kind of seemed... Seems like they won that one. And then X over here to finish it off. They, they're just kind of always a, a surly person. Whenever you see them around, they're just, I don't know. I mean, yeah, they're nice, but it's, uh, they always seem like they're a little bit on edge. Y over here, you enjoy being with them, right? You know, I'll just put a positive here, a plus, negative, positive. Just very affable, very gregarious, friendly, outgoing, social, very supportive, caring, empathetic. I mean, we can go on and on and on with with all the descriptive words. And so you look at the resumes. I mean, let's be honest. Who seems to be the one that should be in the kingdom of God? If you look at the resume, if you had to judge, it's a blind resume. You, you don't know them, right? And some of these people here, you might, you might be looking over here and you might be like, someone on Saturday came up to me after the worship service and they said, you know, hey, why are you, why are you putting my life on, on, on the whiteboard? And I said, well, okay, I guess it just works that way sometimes, right? And you say, well, out of X and Y, it's a blind resume you don't know. It seems as if Y should be the one that should be in the kingdom. Remember what we said about the Beatitudes. The purpose of the Beatitudes is that God is saying that the blessings are going to flow in a way that seems counterintuitive to the way human nature thinks in sin. That we are programmed by sin. And what the Beatitudes are doing is trying to deprogram us. And that's really what the church, in, in a certain sense, one of its missions. So you got things like word and sacrament ministry. You got mission of human care. Acts of mercy. You've got raising kids in the faith. You've got fellowship. You've got all different things that are, 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 are focuses of the church. One of them is to help us understand a, a worldview. How do we see life? How do we see God? How do we see ourselves? And how do we see this relationship with God and us and one another with Christ at the center of those relationships? The Beatitudes are really this, it's a worldview. How do you see the Christian life? Because how we see it sometimes isn't, because of our sin again. Remember, sin is always getting in the way of understanding the kingdom. That Jesus then is t teach us what is the kingdom. Remember, he starts off the Beatitudes that way. He says, this is the kingdom. See, what Jesus is saying is, let's take away the blind part and let's see. So we'll just take away the, the blind part of the resume like they do in college football. And what Jesus is saying, let's just say that the first one, you know, they only gave 5%, involved a little bit, family, marital life, attitude, negative, one, though, this person, though, mourns over their fallen state. And the other one really has no interest 
in the kingdom of God. No interest in the gospel, forgiveness, the cross, Jesus. And what Jesus is saying, see, when we first looked at that resume, you all said the one on the right is the one that should get in. They're the one that earned it. They're the one that deserved it. And Jesus, again, the Beatitudes, is trying to flip the script. Blessed will be the one, and this will be the one that will be comforted. Because this individual, even over here, even though I listed the good things, they still got a lot of, they got a lot of baggage. They have a lot of issues. They have a lot of struggles. They have a lot of challenges. They have a lot of things that they're working through. And Jesus says the one that will be selected, the one that will get in, the one who will be comforted, will be the one who mourns, even if you don't think they deserve it. Blessed are those who mourn. This individual who comes into God's house, and they say, yeah, God, I'm giving this all to you. And Jesus says, and I'm going to give you so much more in return. I'm going to give you all the kingdom and all the treasure of heaven. Jesus knows that you and I live in a world when it comes to our sin, that there is always, by human nature, the old Adam, the old sinful flesh. We use these terms, and, and, and in the church, we use them to our, our benefit, but we also use them to our detriment. A lot of times we use them to our detriment because we don't explain what they mean or how they apply to our life. The old Adam or the old sinful nature is the natural tendency for us not to mourn over our sin, but what Scripture will, will tell us is that it revels in their sin, that it, it glorifies their sin, that it, it, it takes pride even in their sin. The, the, remember in the days of the Old Testament, and the, and, and, and the epistles pick up on this later in the New Testament, it says it's going to be like this again at the end time. Remember, there's old Noah, and he's weeping over the sin of the world because they turn their back on, on God. And they're living all these lifestyles and all these beliefs and all these ideas that are so counter to the word of God. And so Noah's mourning over them, hoping that they will, they, they will come to repentance. And God warns me, he gives them 120 years, right, to come to repentance. And there's old Noah, he's building a boat, right? Nothing against any of you that are from Kansas, all right? It's a great state, right? But it's as if Noah is building a boat in the middle of Kansas. There's no water anywhere near Kansas. And everybody is just, they're, they're, they're scoffing at him. And, and they glorify their shame. In fact, Scripture says this. Scripture says that the world is going to take the dark things that they do and they're going to not mourn over them or, or, or look as if they're bad. They're going to glorify them. In fact, Scripture even says they're going to call the dark things light. And the light they're going to call darkness. That's what Paul says. They glorify even in their shame. See, you and I live in a world where, for example, something like sexuality. Remember, the Bible reminds us that sexuality's beauty is expressed within the gift of marriage. One man, one woman. And we live in a world where what? Lifestyles that are lived outside of that are given flags with beautiful rainbows. And they're paraded around towns and in sporting events. And they are lauded and praised and glorified. And what Jesus is saying in the Beatitudes is he's saying, it's this plea of love and this invitation to say, this is something to be mourned. Not something to be applauded. There will be no comfort for you, Jesus is saying. You're walking away from my Father. I'm the way. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light in a path. This isn't some generic route through life. How to navigate taking the ACTs to get into the school of your choice. That's not what he's talking about in the word of God. It's to understand what is to be glorified and what is shame. What is light, what is darkness, what is to be celebrated, and what is to be mourned. Sticking with the football theme, you watch the halftime of, of the Super Bowl. And there's this decadence right on on the stage of the halftime entertainment that's demeaning i guess you could say to, to all women flaunted and after the performance the commentators and those on social media afterwards 
they do what? They uphold the person as a generational and a cultural icon. And grandpa's over here just trying to cover the eyes of his grandkids, right? They glory, Paul says, they glory in their shame. The, the husband who's been gifted with two beautiful children and a wonderful wife, but he wants his freedom. And so he deserts and walks away from the family. In society at times, they glorify that, saying, well, well, it's good for you to take control of your own personal life and to seek out your own happiness. Clickbait is all over the internet. And it's there as light, supposedly, to entice and to allure. And Jesus says, no, these are things to be mourned. Remember, Scripture says that David, King David, Jesus says, was a man after his own heart. David's resume was a hot mess. There were good things in David's life, but there were so many things that were a disaster. And remember, David, he, he murders Uriah with this scheme to then take Bathsheba and, and to take Bathsheba as his wife in this adulterous affair. And when David is approached with this, the reason why Jesus says, this David is a man after my own heart, he's not glorifying his behavior. He's not lauding it. He's saying why he's a man after his own heart was because he was a man when he was confronted with sin. Remember, the prophet Nathan confronts him. And he mourns his sin. He does not justify, he does not excuse, he does not rationalize, he does not even try to celebrate, but yet he mourns. And Jesus says, David is the one who was comforted. He was the one who now sits in his heavenly home. Our gospel lesson for this day, it reminds us of the work of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit does many things, but it's two primary tasks when the Word of God is, is, is shared with you, when you read it in a devotional, when you have a conversation around the Word of God, or in a house like this where it's, where it's preached or where it's taught, is the Word of God should always do two things. And, and one of that's alluded to in our Gospel lesson to this day, and the other, the first, is all over the pages of Scripture. And they're the two C's, so they're easy to remember. The work of the Holy Spirit is to convict, that leads to mourning, and to comfort, which leads to to tears. The Holy Spirit then, he, he, should, he, he preaches the law through the, the church in the Reformation time. Luther called it this and the Reformers called it. It said that the church was the voice house of God. So the pulpit, that's why even in, the pulpit is elevated, right? In some churches going way back in history, the church was, you know, you maybe grew up in one of those churches where the pastor had to climb the stairs to get up the pulpit. That wasn't just for a practical purpose of, of sound and audio. It was the idea of the heightening importance of the Word of God that convicts and comforts. That when you listen to a sermon, if a sermon is a good sermon, if you're judging the sermon, the sermon should be as such that it convicts you of your own sin where the sin uh, that, that you and I are stuck in, uh, the hairs on the back of our head should kind of stand up. You should walk out of church and you should tell your spouse that, you know, the pastor that day was kind of bringing the heat. He was bringing his fastball, so to speak, right? That you're like, holy cow, you know, he was kind of on fire in that sense. I'm not talking about fire and brimstone, but I'm just talking about a biblical conviction of the sin that we live. And that there, there's a sense of realizing what we have done. Because you look at the world and all the hurt. And again, it's not they're responsible. It's I'm responsible. In the book of Acts, when Peter and Paul, whenever they preach, they always say you. You did this. It's probably one of the reasons why they, they put him to death, right? You did this. You are the cause of this. You have brought this. And Jesus, they're just picking up on this passage of the Beatitudes. There's this mourning of sin. But Jesus then, as our Old Testament lesson this day says, he became a man of sorrow for us. That doesn't mean he was depressed. It doesn't mean he was negative Nancy. It means that he took the sorrow and the hurt and the mourning of all of our sin and he took that onto himself and he put it to the cross and he buried it in the tomb. And now what God asks of you is this. Exchange your tears of sadness and then the second part of any sermon should be that you walk out and you're like, I know that I have this comfort. I have this comfort in Christ Jesus that I know that I am a forgiven child of God. Heaven is my home. Not 100%, but 110%. And nothing can take this away from me. 
Martin Luther said, he said, when I look at myself, he said, I, I am convinced and I realize that there is no way that I can be saved. And he's like, I mourn that. But he said, but when I look at Christ Jesus and what he's done for me, he's the man of sorrow. He died for me. He buried my sins in the tomb. And God now asks just one thing of you, requires one thing of you. Don't resurrect your sins. Don't bring them back up. He killed them. Leave them dead. The gospel and the church and Christ only has a, a, a forward look. There's no rearview mirrors. And Luther said, when I look at the cross, he said, then I realize, and, and my tears of sadness are exchanged for tears of gladness. He said, when I look at the cross, he said, I realize, how can I not be saved? There's this, these tears of great joy saying, this is how much that God loved me. And my resume is going to be a hot mess in this life. And it's not going to look too good. And the burden, what does Jesus mean by cast all of your cares and your burdens on me? The burden that, has been re that I've been released from and this freedom of the gospel is this joy and this certainty of knowing that, that Christ Jesus, he has done everything. And those tears of gladness then, it, it just, it, it moves us. It then moves us to love and to care and concern and, and to be gentle and kind and, and humble, to be a peacemaker, as another beatitude will say. And, and having this gift is why then the net, one of the marks of the Christian coming up is there will be this hunger and thirst for the gospel. To close this day, the, the life of a Christian's growth doesn't necessarily mean that suddenly they, they become a better person. Uh, you can ask, you know, I'll pick on, you can ask these guys. I mean, I hope that I've grown in my Christian life over the years, but I'll have to be honest with you, I haven't become a better father over the years. In fact, I've probably become a worse father over the years, right? And they probably, they're probably shaking their head like, yeah, he's, he's, not, he's, he's not doing too good. You know, he could do a lot better. It's not the growth in my Christian life is suddenly are, that I automatically become a, a better person. But the growth of the Christian life is an intensity of realizing as we grow in the Word of God that, that we realize that we more and more realize what our sin has done to us in the world. And it's this joy then we realize of what God has done for me free and full. And then there's this hunger, this thirst. It's kind of like, I need to be here. This is the one house where I have got to be at because this is where I'm fed with this gift. And this is the most important gift in my Christian life. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they will not only be comforted this day, but as we'll see in the weeks ahead, they will also be filled. When I look at myself, Luther said, there's no way that I can be saved. But I've been comforted by the Holy Spirit as he convicts me of my sin. For when I look at that cross, how can I not? To him be all glory forever and ever. Amen. As we continue our service this day, as we remember the offerings that we do give in these different times, so therefore during this stu study, this walk through the Beatitudes, we will join together and sing an offertory, and we give thee but thy own as we remember those gifts and offerings. We stand to sing. On this Labor Day weekend, we remember the joy and the gift of our labor as we join together in the response as printed a litany of labor. 
Almighty God, you formed us lovingly out of the dust of the earth. You breathed into us the breath of life and gave us work and purpose for living. You placed Adam in the Garden of Eden to till and keep it. Through our work, we are privileged to serve the world in which we live. You gave dignity to our labor by sending your Son to labor with us. By our labor, you enrich the world. By our labor, we enjoy the fruits of creation. By our labor, we find direction and purpose. By our labor, our families are made secure. For providing varieties of work and for blessing us by our labor, we give you thanks, O Lord. You bless us all with skills and gifts for labor. You provide us opportunities to use them for the benefit of others as well as ourselves. Guard and protect those who labor in the world. Bless the work of our hands, O Lord. Look kindly upon the unemployed and the disabled. Give health to the sick, hope to the bereaved. Keep us from laboring only for greed. Make us loving and responsible in all that we do. Heavenly Father, you invite us to bring our prayers and petitions before your throne of grace. And this day, we give you thanks for a successful surgery for Paula Patrick. We pray that you would be with Dudley Foster, who was recently hospitalized with low blood pressure. We pray for Sherry, the mother of Stephanie Miller, recently diagnosed with cancer. We also lift up before your abiding arms, Evelyn, the mother of Fred Moore, who was placed on hospice care. In that sure and certain hope of everlasting life, we ask that you would be with the family of Debbie and Rod Russell at the recent death of a dear family member, Susanna. We pray, O oh Lord, that that light and hope of the resurrection may be with them in this season of life. We lift up before you uh, the good gift of marriage. As we share a prayer of thanksgiving this morning, Heather Boyle and Robbie Hensley recently announced their engagement as they look forward to be married in April of 2021. We pray that you would be with Heather and Robbie as they prepare not only for a wedded day, but also a wedded life together in Christ. For these and all other things, O Lord, we give you thanks as our Creator, Lord, for you are the source of all wisdom and purpose. You are the blessing of those who labor. Be with us in that labor to guide and govern our world. Give all men and women work that enhances human dignity and bonds us to one another. Give us pride in our work, a fair return for our labor, and joy in knowing that our work finds its source in you. We pray this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom as you teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And our Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new testament of my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Congregation may be seated for our distribution. And take and eat the true body of Christ given for you. And take and drink the true blood of Christ shed for you. And now may this true body and blood of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you unto life everlasting. Depart in his joy and in his peace. Amen. And we continue this day as we stand for the post-communion prayer.
O oh God the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in the sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Lord, take my hand and lead me, our hymn, to close this day. We remain standing to sing. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord's blessings on your week. Mm -hmm.